Hey guys, number one Marmaduke fan here, looking at Anonymous Noise, volume 13. This one also contains the short story, Spill Gelatin. And one of the things is if I'm reading a series by an artist and then I get to read one of their short stories, it's kind of a nice chance to see uh, what kind of things they like. Are there tropes or ideas or plots that they are really attracted to that are outside of the main series. Because if you're in the main series, you're kind of focused on the main characters in the main series. So this is going to be kind of like a double review where we'll continue talking about Anonymous Noise and what I gleaned from that short story. If we have time, I'll also do like a really quick uh, Western comic to make this a East versus West mashup. So Anonymous Noise, it's, a, uh, it's not super complicated. It's complicated enough I'd read it from the beginning and work your way through it. But she de generally does a really good job of catching you up. And one of the things I'm gonna talk about is she's, Ryoko is very, very good at having each chapter contain a strong emotional beat to keep you invested and of weaving together subplots. So the tried and true love triangle, it's a bit old. You've gotta do something to mix it up and make it interesting. So there's this rock and roll angle to it. Uh, there's all of this you know, slice of life comedy to it that's personality base there's a flawed character who has problems and she thinks in her brain about how to fix her problems so she's not an npc there's lots of good things that are keeping me invested so uh the main character nino arisugawa her surname arisugawa is a pun on alice as in alice in wonderland and in the rock band she plays the role of alice so they call her both things nino alice nino nino Alice. It's almost like Alice in Wonderland is a metaphor for her in a way. Uh, this whole time she's been caught in this uh, twisted, romantically, emotionally bonkers triangle uh, between Momo, her childhood friend who uh, moved away and she never saw him again until he came back into her life and she's been chasing him ever since, and Yuzu, uh, a boy who loves her and makes music for her. And she's not in love with Yuzu, but she's sort of in love with Yuzu's music. It's like the best game that Yuzu has is all the, just the romantic beauty of the music he makes for her. And she and Yuzu have a very good working relationship. They make beautiful music together. Now, uh, Al Nino has gotten back with Momo. Yuzu is defeated. He has to leave to take care of some family business. And he comes back. He's grown a few inches. And he is determined to take Alice back from Momo. Uh, looking at this, so a couple things is I like how the uh, exhaustion, like the phys physical dedication it takes to do rock and roll music is always emphasized. Like they're always sweating. They're always like, you know, hair is out of, out of place. They're putting everything into it and like there'll be like lots of like silly gags about doing rock solos and things like that i kind of like reading this before watching uh the anime because i got to like imagine what the music would be like in my head but uh hopping forward yuzu is back and he loves nino and he can't contain it so he basically like he, he's she already knows that he loves her but he basically makes a move and says look Le because you're with Momo, ever since you've gotten with Momo, your singing sucks and you're going to lose singing as long as you're with Momo and singing is something you love. It's something that's defined you. Dump Momo and get with me. And he moves in for, it looks like it could be a kiss, but we find out later it's, it's just a hug, right? So uh, the underdog Yuzu is making his power move for uh, Nino's affection. But she love, loves Momo sincerely. So even though she's torturing herself about whether she'll ever be able to s sing beautifully again, uh, it's not going to pan out for Yuzu. Later, he decides he's going to go to ap apologize to her, but then there's like a gag at the end where she runs off before he gets his chance to apologize for her. But he feels Yuzu feels bad about adding more emotional basket case problems to Alice's life. Uh, meanwhile, Kuro, the drummer, who's been a simp has finally uh, seems to finally be getting a girl and i like how there's a consistent theme of like simp men who are just pining from afar and then they're put into a situation where they have to man up and like legitimately develop their game so and the what, what would she be she's a first year which 
is like the equivalent of 15 years old in our school system, but it's kind of the it's the cultural equivalent of a freshman in the Japanese high, high school system. So she calls them all senpai, and Anne has this, she's a really tall girl, and she kind of has like this deadpan, icy cold uh, persona to her, and she's been teasing Kuro a little bit. Like, is she dropping hints or is she being a jerk? He's not really sure. She basically nudges him into taking her to this uh, rock rock thing, and they bump into her old boyfriend. Her old boyfriend's like a a big jerk. So Kuro, Kuro uh, as a way, like the boyfriend, old boyfriend says, "Oh, I bet you'll never get a boyfriend." So who are you? As a matter of fact, I'm her boyfriend, all right. And he, as a way of teasing the old the other guy. <laughs> but he takes her completely by surprise. And what's great about this from a personality perspective is this whole time she's been very stoic and hard to read. And so instantly with this close-up, we get a, a read on her that she feels something about this. She feels something about this. All right. And basically, Kuro, who's been a simp, he's, he's chatting up. He, he, this is the chatification of the simp. So that's great. Uh, hopping ahead, this is an example of Ryoko always doing a big, strong character moment in every chapter. So Mio originally played Alice in the band before Nino came and took on the role of Alice. And this is something that Mio has always felt a little uh, a little envy about. She, she kind of resents the fact that Nino is the one that Yuzu's always been in love with and everybody kind of looks at Mio as the replacement to, to uh, the replacement to Nino. So that, that sucks. Like nobody likes being the backup. But Mio actually kind of legitimately likes Alice. So there's this complex thing where she kind of resents her a little bit, but she actually likes her as a person. So, you know, they, they get along. But Mio's a more classically trained singer. Ni Miu, Miu's a more classically trained singer. Nino is a, ta a more talented singer, but with less classical training. And she's rough. She doesn't have much control. So Miu, this whole time, has been pushing herself to be the best singer she po possibly can. And Nino, the, the talented singer... Uh, has this moment where she realizes that Miu's continually surpassing her, Miu's continually improving. She feels like she's falling behind. And just like in kind of boyish uh, battle manga, uh, there's always this great thing where rivalry is good. It pushes you to uh, pushes you farther and farther. So seeing someone better than her, seeing someone improve and improve and improve makes her want to do that her, herself and also underscores the what she feels bad about, which is she hasn't been singing well recently. All of this is going to be building up towards the, the best thing is all of the rock and roll sequences. Almost all of them have a great emotional subtext to them that add a lot of drama to the, like this bonkers rock and roll show that these kids put on. So I, uh, Yuzu, who's always like a really good coach, gives them some really good advice. We play for right now like we always do. We don't worry about the next show that's coming up after this. We're going to play this show as if it was our last. But Nino, being emotionally bonkers, uh, decide she has her own crazy interpretation of that advice. Uh, she confesses her feelings to Momo finally. This is the first time she's directly said, I love you, Momo. And she's basically come to this conclusion in her head that if she's with Momo, she can't sing anymore. It's like that, that idea is bogging her down. So her, uh, Nino's an idiot. She's, it's, she's kind of like an adorable idiot. Uh, it, it, what is it? It's, it, she, it's endearing. She's, she, she's endearingly idiotic. <laughs> like sometimes she tries to work hard to overcome that idiocy, but her idiocy is still like a recurring problem for her. So her idiot decision is this is going to be the last show I ever play. So I'm going to sing uh, my lungs out, even if it means I lose my voice forever, because I, if this is going to be the last show I ever play, then I'm going to leave it all on stage. That's her, that's her dumb solution to this. So of course, when they're on stage, everything is just going bonkers. She's screaming her head off. She'll, they'll start playing a song and she'll start singing the wrong song. So again, she's in love with Momo, but Yuzu has game and he actually, he, what I, the reason I'm kind of on team Yuzu is like how good their working relationship is. Like he actually, knew, like she's, you know, Momo's like all kissy, uh, kissy face with her, but Yuzu actually kind of gets Alice and sees when she's going on a self-destructive path, and he's really good at talking her down off of her cra her crazy shenanigans. So he like gets gets a hold of her. He says, "I know what you're doing. Uh, you're trying. You're going to sing loud enough to wreck your voice. Don't do that. Not while you can still." 
play. And he actually like totally, it, it's hilarious because they keep changing up the songs or she's singing the wrong song. He deliberately tries to change the order of the song so that he can give her voice a rest and then she'll sing the wrong song and he'll start making up a new song on the stage and the people backstage are just going nuts not knowing what they're going to do. Uh, and Yuzu is basically forced to this point where if he's going to stop Alice from doing this, he's got to do something on the stage while the rock show is happening to convince her to quit uh, shredding her voice. And uh, this is where uh, I said earlier that Ryoko is brilliant at using her subplots. Well, there's been a subplot this whole time I haven't talked about much because it's been pretty subtle. But there's the subplot that... Uh, uh, Yuzu doesn't sing anymore. He could sing when he was a little boy. When he and Alice uh, first met, he sang to her because she was, again, like depressed and self-destructive and she was going to sing until she couldn't sing anymore. So he sang to her to like shock her out of it and stop her. But in in singing, he damaged his voice and he's never been able to sing since then. He's wanted to sing and uh, he's been talking to the band about how sometime this year, I would like to try singing again if I, if I feel up to it. And his mother, who's kind of a weird control freak, has said, if you don't sing for me, I'm not going to let you write music anymore. So the clock, the clock is ticking, right? So the Yuzu uh, wants to sing again on stage subplot has been in the background. But every single time, uh, there's just never been, it's never been the right moment for him to do it, right? <laughs> So you know that eventually he's going to sing. And what he realizes on stage is that if he's going to save Alice's voice, he has to sing himself. Oh, my gosh. This story is bonkers, and I love it. All right. With that, let's talk. I want to find out what happens next. But uh, let's talk about spilled gelatin. So uh, this is a one-off story. Uh, it's a few years older than her current work. And I'm going to, like, acknowledge this up front. This is a really taboo uh, subject that she touches on in spilled gelatin, like knock, 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 FBI, open up. Oh no. Uh, but one kind of creative thing she does is she actually kind of like subverts it. So let, 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 let's talk about it. So, uh, from Jordan Peterson, I've learned that a lot of burlesque romances are targeted at women will have kind of like this tub, uh, taboo subtext to them. Like it's always a vampire or a, va a werewolf or a billionaire or a surgeon, right? It's always like a really aggressive, assertive man chasing after the ladies in the female, in the female romance novels. So what uh, Ryoko does is she kind of introduces something that is close to illegal, but not quite. So let me explain what it, what it is. So, uh, Kuro is like a 25-year-old uh, struggling photographer. He basically is feeling disrespected by the industry, and so he's not working right now. And w at, b before we find out what's going on, we get a little scene of him with like a young younger girl in his house, and she roasts him, and he it's kind of like a cute little tête-à-tête uh, -tête between the two of them. And then we rewind in time. Oh, and there's like this really goofy. So one of the things I learned about Ryoko from this is she likes really goofy. Uh, metaphors that are that she uses to actually kind of make substan substantial points. In this, the goofy visual metaphor is spilled gelatin. So he always eats sweet things. Uh, uh, I, they use it in a couple different ways. It, it's not it's not a very good metaphor. In anonymous noise, she uses the metaphor of the mask, and the mask is a fantastic metaphor because you know she has characters who are hiding their fe feelings. Nino wears a mask to keep herself from screaming because she kind of lacks self-control and so she represses her emotions using a mask. So the mask in Anonymous Noise is this fantastic uh, continual metaphor that she uses in multiple different ways. So in this, the spilled jello, that's not very romantic, but the spilled jello is some kind of kind of metaphor. But uh, Kuro, when we flash back in time, we see Kuro's frustrations, like he wants to be taken seriously as a photographer, but everybody just sees him as a pretty face. And this girl arrives and she is his step cousin. They're not related by blood, but she is the uh, daughter of, uh, what is it? His step uncle? I think I have it right, but they're not, re they're not related by blood at all. But her parents die. He's her closest relative. So she she just shows up and says, I've got to move in with you. Now, I don't know what the Japanese law is. Does that make him her legal guardian? Or is she just like bumming a, uh, bumming a bed at his place? Because he he's all, I, I don't know if this is official or not. But anyway, 
uh, this girl has to move in with him. And he's technically her legal guardian now. Uh, and she has kind of like this cold black cat personality, right? Like she'll be a bit of a minx. She'll tease him. She'll roast him for not having a job. Uh, but underneath that, she's really hurt about losing her parents. And so he actually has to kind of be support supportive to her in that situation. Now, uh, the taboo part of this, of course, is that she's like a high school student. He's a fully grown man. Uh, he's le he's literally her legal guardian. It would be illegal for him to be romantically interested in her. And he's not romantically interested in her. He's he's interested in fully grown women. But what we find out is she's romantically interested in him. Oh, no. Oh, no. So and sometimes they'll do things like she'll tease him a little bit like, hey, uh, what couldn't we fall in love? Cousins fall, can fall in love and he'll just tease her right back. But he's not serious about it. Uh, later, uh, they kind of like take some photographs together and he explains, you know, the camera he uses. And there's a flashback to like his childhood with where he was taking photos with his grandpa. So, right. So photography is something that's really important to him as an art form, as a personal part of his uh, life. Uh, and Ryoko actually has some really sweet commentaries where she owns a camera like this. Her grandfather owned a camera like this. And she said, I kind of regretted not talking to my grandfather about photography more when I was a child because I wasn't interested in photography as a child. I became interested in photography after my grandfather passed. So in a way, this story was kind of a way of her imagining a sweet thing for a character loosely based on her life experience, but kind of like based on the fact that she didn't get to have a moment like, like that with her grandfather. Let's give this character a moment like that. Uh, then one night, like, uh, the high school girl comes in and says, I, I, I'm having nightmares. Can I just sleep at, uh, your feet? And he gets kicked out of his bed and gives her his, his, his bed, right? So you see, there's no sex going on. He's, he, it's just this complicated thing where he's young and she's old enough that if, if he waited till she was 18, I guess they could leg legally be dating, right? I actually don't know if he is her legal guardian. I, I have no idea what the law is. Is this is illegal or not? Is the FBI going to kick down my door or not? But uh, he he's basically having to be like a support a supportive guy for this kid who is having these emotional problems. Now, uh, he he says he lo loves her, which I take to mean that. He doesn't love her sexually, but he kind of loves her as a person. And so he starts taking photographs of her because his grandfather told him, if, if you love someone, take take photos of them. So you have that memory. So he starts taking photos of her to have to preserve these memories. So it seems to me that he loves her in kind of this platonic way, not not a sexual way, because he actually has like grown women that he, he that he's sleeping with. Then surprise, surprise, she's in love with him. She she cries and she runs away from home and he doesn't know. Uh, what's happened to her. He tries to get his act together and get his life back together. Uh, that, so she's kissing him, see? Then after he gets his life back together, he finds her again, and she says, well, I've just been crashing at an internet cafe this whole time. Uh, can, can, can I move back in? Can I move back in with you? Uh, even, even if we can't be together. He says, okay, you can move back in with me. And they kind of hint at the end that maybe one day, maybe one day when she's old enough, then they'll be able to fall in love in love with each other. So you see how taboo that is. But what, what's clever about that is nothing illegal actually takes place. It's sort of like what she's interested in is the forbidden romance itself is kind of seductive or uh, fa fascinating to her. So pretty close to illegal, but. Uh, I, I actually think it was kind of it, it actually promoted a nice moral, I think, while dealing with a taboo subject, because at no point was the guy ever romantically interested in the high school student. He j he he fell in love with her in a platonic sense. So I guess I, I, I do girls find that romantic. I don't know. But uh, it's not as good as anonymous noise. But it is it was kind of interesting to see like the emphasis on personality, kind of like that back and forth comedy. Uh, Ryoko is really, really good at that. So there you go. 20 minutes. Let's wrap it up with a really quick comment on Fantastic Four number 37. It's just a great solid issue. A uh, few th great things about it. It's a self-contained adventure story. Wow. It catches you up on everything you need to know about the drama. It's got a lot of that classic, you know, Jack Kirby crazy space stuff and experimenting with photo litho processes. And I really got, got a lot of respect for Stan Lee's ability uh, to use his 
writing and narration to address issues in the comic. So one thing is if you're kind of like flipping through this and you turn to this, that would be a really sudden uh, jarring transition. So Stanley has this cutesy comment where perhaps reader, you don't believe that this story really took place. Well, here is photographic evidence that it, that it took place. Uh, uh, unfortunately, none of our earthly cameras can uh, record the strange atmosphere of Cree space. So it's a little hazy, right? So he actually comes up with an in-universe explanation for Jack Kirby's experimentation with uh, photo litho processes. There's some, you know, great old classic. Uh, the team shows up and they're made powerless and imprisoned. And there's a goofy uh, romance in the background where the girl is in love with the bad guy, even though she knows he's evil. He, she hopes that she can redeem him, even though she knows he's a wicked, wicked man. Oh, why am I in love with you, Stanley? It's so romantic and so cheesy. I love it. Uh, there's a great old twister -roo where Reed Richards says the Bugs Bunny thing to get him out of. Uh, trouble. What was the other thing I wanted to comment on? So I want to talk about how good Stanley was at explaining uh, things in the art. Oh yeah, there's a great, there's a fantastic panel in here where, uh, you know, the stupid girl is going to run and put herself between the uh, gunshots and the bad boyfriend and then they fire on her, right? And so one of the things that you would ask is, well, why don't they hold their fire? So Stanley actually writes in their dialogue, purple prose, which explains why they can't hold their fire. She ran into the line of fire before I could stop my men. And now, my child, what have I done to you? May the gods forgive us. Our weapons were set. We could not stay our hands in time. Right. So what's great about this is Stanley is fixing a potential plot point by using his speech balloons to address it. And it adds some of this great, you know, character drama uh, dialogue. Good triumphs over evil. And they set up the wedding of uh, Ben and Sue Richards in a Christian uh, uh, church. Cr good classic Christian comics. Fantastic. All right. So perfectly fun issue. It, uh, one of the fun things actually about reading these random issues is I guess you don't get to feel like the whole sweep of the building expansive Marvel Universe, but it's actually kind of fun to just grab a random one and see how it holds up all on its own. And these old Stanley Jack Kirby uh, books really hold up as just one issue books. Like you grab it, you get a good time. They tell you about the, uh, you know, a couple old issues. You should go check out for more adventures, but everything you need to know you get in this one book, it has at the end at the end, and it feels like a nice ending at the end. Fantastic. Uh, pick it up if you see it in the $1 rack, and that is it. I'm number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Catch you later.